Hey guys, welcome back. Today we are going to be looking at the first half of chapter nine, functional and comparative genomics. And we're really gonna be focusing on the comparative part of this today. So being able to use the genomics tools that we built over the last couple of lectures to actually compare different attributes of different genomes. So what is functional genomics? So just in general, functional genomics, we're looking to gain information about gene function. So that's something that we've been talking about the entire semester. We've been really thinking about trying to compare the phenotype to the genotype. And everything that we've done up until now, um, gene discovery through QTL mapping, where we actually looked at figuring out where a gene would be based off of recombination frequencies and other attributes of the chromosome, um, that is going to be this sort of direction of we see a phenotype that we like and we're trying to figure out what is this gene? What is the gene going to be doing? What exactly, you know, is type of gene is this going to be? So that type of analysis where we're going from the phenotype that we see to the gene that we're interested in, we start with the phenotype, that's going to be something called forward genetics. Okay, so the things that we're going to be looking at in this chapter are going to be more of a reverse genetics technique. And so what this is really going to mean is that we have a gene that we're interested in, and we may not know what phenotype it causes. So we'll be talking about how do we even know the gene is there if we're not sure about how it affects the phenotype. So that'll be something that we'll be talking about in the next few slides. We can get information about these types of genes. We're trying to go again from the gene that we see to figuring out what phenotype it will cause. What is it actually doing? How does it affect the organism? We can get a lot of information about this. So we can get information about these genes through computational predictions or in silico predictions of protein function. Alternatively, we'll also be looking at some experimental approaches today. So we'll start with just a general overview of the way that these in silico or these computational types of predictions can help us out. So this is just, again, a really general example of ways that we can kind of lump different genes together based off of the sequence of the gene or the sequence of the protein that we're going to get out of it. So what we're looking at on the left-hand side of this, this is actually going to be a categorization by what exactly this protein is going to look like. So what are the actual physical attributes of this protein? Does it have an area that looks like it's going to bind DNA? Okay, so maybe it is going to have a job doing some DNA binding, or maybe it has a domain that looks like something that we know would transport small molecules. Okay, so this is kind of thinking about specific attributes of the proteins in question. So we see a protein, we don't know what it does. We can compare it to all of the other proteins that we know about and say, okay, that's really similar to, again, something that is gonna be involved with cytoskeletal elements or sort of these structural proteins. Or it might be something that looks a little bit more like a transcription factor. So actually comparing this novel gene, this novel protein that we found, two things that we already know. And on, again, on this left half, we're really focusing on the specific attributes of that protein. So this would be like if we compare different types of transportation or vehicles. So maybe we can compare, um, you know, like giant 18-wheeler to maybe something like a cargo train or something like that. Like they'll have different attributes, but they're going to be kind of all involved with the same process which leads us over to the right-hand half of this. And this is just another way to organize proteins, organize things that are gonna be doing a job in the cell. So on the left-hand side, we're looking again at things like, what are the physical attributes of this protein? On the right-hand side, we're categorizing them by what process are they gonna be involved in? So again, to go back to that example, like some things might look like a semi, some things might look like sort of like this freight or cargo trains or maybe um, some type of like cargo ship. Okay, they're a little bit different, but they would be involved in transportation. 
So that's the kind of thing we're looking at on the right is what are they involved in? So you can even see that we have a transport category. Maybe these proteins don't look physically similar. Maybe they don't have identical sorts of attributes, but they might all be involved in transport. Okay, so we might see some things that are involved in the cell cycle. A lot goes on in the cell cycle. Okay, so you're not going to have proteins that are going to be all of one type. You're going to need things that are going to be transcription regulators, transcription factors. You're going to need to really restructure the cytoskeleton. You're going to need a lot of signaling, which would be, again, probably like transfers of functional groups and other types of things. Okay, so you can have a lot of different things going on. This is just another way to categorize them. And we've been able to get a lot of information about this type of thing from gene expression studies, like we've been talking about in lab. So again, maybe we don't know everything that's involved with the cell cycle, but by studying the cell cycle, by looking at all of the RNAs produced, we can say, okay, I see that these particular proteins are gonna be around during the cell cycle, but I don't exactly know what that protein does. How is it contributing? So that's how we're able to get a lot of this information. And again, once we do identify something that will be more highly or less expressed in a particular circumstance, we can also flip it back over and say, okay, this is highly expressed or it's not expressed as much. It's similar to one of these categories over here. And again, this is a, not an exhaustive list, but it's enough to kind of get us started. So this would be sort of this functional genomics going from a gene to a protein. So by the end of this, we'll have seen a lot of experimental techniques for verifying this. So today we're just gonna be doing some of the comparative stuff. We'll be actually messing around with some of these novel proteins, novel things that we're interested in in the next video. Okay, so we think about comparative genomics. This is exactly what it sounds like. So don't let this be a hard concept. So really anything that you want to compare, that you feel that it's worth putting the work in to compare. So this can be differences in gene functions, differences in gene position. We'll see some examples of this at the end. Differences in gene expression. This is going to be a really big one and one that we've been talking about in lab. So anything that you want to compare, um, particularly if you do see um, differences in phenotype that you're interested in and you want to figure out you know a little bit more about that too we can certainly think about comparing um, things that are going on in two different samples so this will really tie in today with some of that transcriptome stuff that we've been talking about so again any kind of situation where you want to know what the difference is so i think that your book uses the example of sporulation and yeast okay so we can kind of use that as our example as well just follow along with the book okay but we'll get started thinking about how we actually will set this up okay so of course in any good experiment you're going to have your experimental sample and your control or what we call a reference sample so when we think about that sporulation example okay we would have for our reference or control sample Organisms that are not going to be undergoing sporulation. They're just going to be in regular interphase. They're not going to be, you know, trying to like do anything weird. Um, they're just going to be living their daily lives. And that would be like more like our reference sample. On the other hand, the ones that are undergoing this, if we want to know what genes are involved with that process, we'd have an experimental sample and we'd want to compare what's going on between the two. Okay, so. Again, we've been talking about quite a lot of gene expression, transcriptome type of stuff in lab. So this will complement that. We're gonna be looking at another way to get at what gene expression differences are gonna be present. So when we have these two samples, the first thing that we're gonna do is collect RNA from these samples. So both our control and our experimental sample these will be our RNA molecules. We can just go ahead and get accustomed to that. And of course, as we work with these experimental samples, you guys know that RNA is a pretty delicate molecule, okay? You don't want to be just waving it around. It's very unstable in water. 
Um, even at room temperature, it's not gonna hang around long. So what we wanna do first off, convert this to cDNA, which is gonna be, again, that DNA that's a copy, a direct copy, hopefully proportional to the amount of RNA that we had in the sample. Okay, so we're just converting it to a cDNA copy. So you can just go ahead and imagine, I didn't do anything to this to make it look different, but just imagine now that it's cDNA. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing, we've talked about in class, things like high throughput sequencing, using an Illumina instrument that can rapidly sequence all of these um, experimental samples, control samples. We can end up with reads, which we can then place back on the reference genome. Um, in lab, we use the RMTA app to do this, but your book goes at it a little bit differently. And today what we're gonna be doing is called a microarray. So to do a microarray, we have to take our samples and we have to distinguish them from each other somehow visually at minimum so that a computer can pick this up. So the way that we're gonna do this is through fluorescent labeling. So Psi-3 and Psi-5 are very common fluorescent dyes used in a microarray type of experiment. We're gonna use one so that our experimental sample fluorescently is pink. Okay, our control sample fluorescently is green. So we're gonna be able to track our samples using this fluorescent color difference, okay? So when we get ready to do the microarray, we've extracted the RNA, we've converted it to the stable cDNA copies, and we've labeled them so we can tell them apart. At this point, we can go ahead and just mix these together. Yeah, this is one of the only times you're ever told you can just go ahead and mix stuff um, like this, okay? So once we, get all, all the stuff just sort of mixed together. We wash it over a special slide, and this slide is special if we zoom in on it. Before we even add any of the cDNA, it actually has tiny microscopic fragments of DNA. So this DNA comes from the organism that we're currently working with. So if we're studying sporulation and yeast, what organism's DNA is this gonna be? Yeah, hopefully you're right with me and you know that this is gonna be DNA from the yeast genome, okay? If we're working with humans and we wanna know human expression, then we gotta get one for humans. And so these types of arrays, um, actually, you, you, know, you can order them from a company, particularly for organisms that are very heavily studied, so, a mouse model, a Arabidopsis, which is a plant model. Um, you can get yeast, human. They actually make these so that they're printed with the coding sequence, the open reading frame from genes that may or may not be expressed. So pretty much all the genes that we know about, we're gonna have represented somewhere. And they're actually sort of printed in place, kind of synthesized in place, so that they're in specific coordinates. So it's not random. It looks random to us, but the computer knows, okay, right here, this is this gene. Right over here, this is the second one. This third one back here, that's a specific one, and that orientation isn't gonna change. So the computer knows where all of these are at any point. And that's gonna be an important quality of this slide. Okay, so now that we have all of our DNA printed on it, it's microscopic, and we have all of these open reading frames printed here, this is called an array. So that's why this experiment, we talk about this being a micro array. Okay, very, very small array where we're looking at the DNA molecules. So now that we've zoomed in on this, and we can see these open reading frames that hopefully capture um, the actual open reading frames in the genome, the representative of all the potential genes that could be expressed, we can go ahead and drop our cDNAs down onto this, okay? So remembering that our control sample, we've labeled green, and our experimental sample is labeled pink, okay? So when they find a matching sequence, they will stick to that. So they'll go ahead and stick to that. And let's kind of think about zooming in on this so that we can see what that actually means. So again, zooming in 
on this, you can see that this particular cDNA, which is again, this is from our experimental sample, it's labeled pink, you can see that it's complementary. So this is just hydrogen bonding. So you can really start to see why understanding those hydrogen bonding rules is so important for molecular biology. Okay, you can see our G paired with C, T to A. You can see all along here that this should pair up. Okay, so this is kind of what we're looking for. So this is similar in a lot of ways to those SNP chips that we looked at in the previous section. Okay, so we have the zoomed in view. We now understand the mechanics. Okay, and I didn't go ahead and fill in these guys in the background, but you can imagine the same type of things happening here. Okay, so we have some options for what's happening. Whenever these cDNAs find a place that they are complementary to, they will stick to it. Okay, so I've gone ahead and numbered these different open reading frames so that we can kind of keep track of them as we go. We start to look at them in, in the way that the computer might see them. We can kind of keep track of what's here. Okay, so you can notice that again here we have one that's going to be stuck from our experimental sample. We have a few floating around here that do not have anything on them at all. Some that are just going to have the reference or control sample. And we're going to see some that actually, again, are going to bind both. Okay, so both at the same time. All right, I've kind of hidden some of the details of this from you, but um, this has a potential to bind more than one of these at one time, the way that this is set up. So we can have basically four options. Okay, either both, we can have one or the other or nothing there. Okay, so let's think about this the way that the computer would see it. So we'll just zoom out for a second. This is our top view. So imagine you've taken what we've just looked at and you're looking at it from the top. So I've tried to kind of preserve where we're actually looking at these labeled samples. Okay, so we saw that in a couple of these, we saw only pink, okay, which Pink was our labeled experimental sample. Some of these we saw only green, okay? Notice what's going on here, that sample where we had both of these bound, okay? So in fluorescence world, green and red or green and pink that I have here, this is gonna make kind of a yellow color and you can see, I mean, I don't know that that is exactly yellow, but in fluorescence language, two, this red and green, these two colors together, this is going to be yellow. So we've got a couple of options. We're going to have pink from our experimental sample, green from our reference sample, an option to have nothing bound at all, or you'll see something where you have kind of an equal ratio, the sort of yellow color. Okay, so you can see these at these different coordinates. So now is a really good time to go ahead and pause that video. What do you think it means when we have each of these colors? What does green mean? Red, yellow, or nothing at all? Okay, really good work thinking about that because I know that you went ahead and actually put some thought into that. All right, so. Let's go ahead and look at some real microarray data to answer this question, okay? So this is real microarray data, this is in your textbook. So you can see that we have a lot of instances where we have green from our reference sample, red, okay, we'll talk about this guy in a second, red from our experimental. We have yellow, okay? So this is gonna be yellow, representing both green and red, okay? And some of these guys are a little bit, you know, is it green, is it yellow? The computer can tell, it can read the wavelengths, okay? So we don't have to pick it out with our eyes. So hopefully, what you're thinking is that anytime you see more of the color from your experimental sample, which is red or pink in my example, this means that more cDNAs stuck, which means there were more cDNAs in there to begin with, which means that this was more highly expressed in the experimental sample, okay? By contrast, having more green, this means that this was more highly expressed 
in the reference sample, or if you want to think about it another way, it was expressed less in the experimental sample. So compared to the control, it's either going to be more and you'll see a red color or less and you'll see a green color. Okay, if we think about the reference or the control, it's kind of the default state. If you see something that's going to be yellow, this means that they're pretty equally expressed. Okay, can you think of anything that would be equally expressed in both of these samples? Okay, maybe you didn't think of anything specific, but hopefully you're thinking along the lines of stuff both types of cells will need. So things like ribosomal RNA, ribosomal components, you're going to need that all the time anyway, okay? So stuff like that that you just need all the time, you're going to see those types of things be yellow. You're going to need to do glycolysis, so you're going to see gene expression related to metabolism in both types of cells, okay? So these yellow spots, these yellow areas correspond to genes that are going to be expressed similarly in both samples. And along those same lines, if you see areas where you're not going to have any expression at all, these are going to be these dark areas. Remember that we are going to have DNAs printed all along here. The computer knows where they are, so you don't have to guess. That just means they're not expressed in either sample. So if we're thinking, you know, maybe this is something related, some of these genes are related to heat stress. Well, this particular set of yeast, they're not undergoing heat stress, they're undergoing just regular standard sporulation. So they don't really have to think about expressing genes related to stress that isn't there. So that's the type of situation you should be thinking about, okay? This here is telomer telomerase protein one, okay? So we talked about telomerase, this is just yeast telomerase. You can see that it is gonna be um, more highly expressed in our experimental sample. So. That's what we're getting at here. So hopefully you've got the idea because we're gonna carry that over. So what we've been talking about up until this point has all been related to gene expression. So really important to keep straight. When we talk about expression, we mean how much transcription is occurring. Are you producing a lot of RNA or are you not producing as much? Have you shut that gene down? Okay, so Gene expression, these microarray experiments, we're talking about RNA production. DNA is DNA, okay? So we're looking at, did we turn a gene on or did we turn it off? That's the situation we've been kind of sitting in, okay? So in the next example, we're gonna flip this a little bit and see how we can use this type of technique to actually compare DNA quantities. So this example is expression. The next one is a similar technique used to compare DNA quantity. Okay, so you might wonder why would you want to compare DNA quantity? Don't we know how much is in there? Aren't things diploid? Um, when we're talking about things like humans at least. Why would you want to do this? Okay, so one example of a reason you might want to do this is as a diagnostic tool. So something that you can think about, the properties of cancer cells. So they have a lot of really terrible properties, um, things like they don't really respect um, personal space boundaries, they do not practice social distancing, they get in everybody's space, they grow where they should not be growing, they grow inappropriately and in conditions where they should not be, um, they sort of like misread all the signals and just keep dividing. But another attribute of this that we haven't talked about very much is because of the way that they rapidly divide and sort of ignore all of the warning signs, all the red flags along the way. They don't really heed the checkpoints that a normal cell would sort of be halted at. We end up a lot of times, pretty much all the time, we're going to end up with chromosomes that have this really weird rearrangement. So those big rearrangements we've talked about in previous chapters. So things like duplicated regions, okay? Loss of whole chromosome segments, okay? You can end up with a lot of like chromosome breakage and sort of like faulty, um, the cell thinks that it's helping and it will try to do this weird sort of like double strand break repair. 
you end up with stuff glued to other stuff, losing chromosomes. It's just a mess the longer these guys divide. And so pretty much all the time you can count on cells from tumors, cancer cells, they're going to largely be in an aneuploid state. So they're gonna have kind of weird numbers of DNA, maybe partial trisomies, um, partial monosomies, they're just gonna be like sitting at a really weird DNA content. Okay, and so actually, you can use this as part of di a diagnostic test when you're looking for cancer. So some of the tests that they run, they have a lot of different tests depending on the type of cancer that you're talking about. But some of the, the things that they can run um, are assays called flow cytometry. So this is actually data from a flow cytometry run. You don't have to understand everything about how this works, but what we're actually doing is just comparing DNA content. So on our x-axis, this is just relative DNA content, okay? So how much DNA is there, all right? So it will account for like a normal amount of DNA. On the y-axis, this is kind of like the number of cells that it tracks that have that level of DNA content. So we're saying somewhere around here, we're sitting at dip, standard diploid content, then a lot of the cells that we're gonna see here are gonna have regular diploid DNA. But you can see that some of these populations of cells, we have quite a few here that are gonna have you know, extra sort of this aneuploid state and then even a third peak over here. These are gonna have extra DNA content. So they're gonna have more DNA than they're supposed to. And again, this is gonna be due to the fact that in cancer cells, we're seeing these really huge chromosomal rearrangements. We're seeing duplications of whole sections. We're seeing, again, not just duplications on the chromosome, but we'll see inversions, translocations, things that are gonna, you know, we're gonna get inversion loops. It's just, we're just gonna end up with the wrong amount of DNA, just total, okay? So what we're gonna be assaying for in this technique that we're talking about Okay, because we didn't come here to talk about flow cytometry, but I think it's probably good to know, particularly if you are interested in um, health careers, this is something that they still fairly routinely use as a diagnostic tool, kind of an interesting aside. We're gonna be using this aneuploid state, this idea that we're gonna have duplications or deletions or these really like large, rearrangements, we're gonna use them to help detect what's going on in cancer cells or to make a diagnosis. So what we can think about is taking biopsies, okay? We can do, again, comparative genomics here. So we'll take some from normal cells and from a tumor that looks suspicious, okay? So I guess that's that little guy up there, okay? And we will extract the DNA from it. So note, we're not dealing with RNA. This is a similar idea but different molecule. We're not using RNA here. We're not caring about expression right now. Okay, so we extract DNA. We've got our experimental tumor sample and our normal cell reference sample. And the first thing that we got to do is break this DNA down into manageable chunks, okay? Because chromosomes are large. They're not going to fit on that little chip the way that we want, okay? So there are a lot of ways to approach this. One of the most common ways is to use a restriction enzyme digest, and you can kind of pick out which one you want, okay? So this is just a specific restriction enzyme. And these are useful to use because they leave ends that we understand. So because we know these restriction sites, it gives us an idea of what's gonna be hanging out at the ends of these cut sites. And that's gonna be useful because once we've done this, our next step will be to amplify these in a PCR step. Okay, and at the same time, kind of label these fluorescently. So again, we're gonna be using our Psi-3 and Psi-5. We've got our pink experimental sample, our green sample that's going to be from our reference cells, okay? So again, no RNA here. We don't care about expression at all. We're only dealing with the DNA. We've broken it down just so it's manageable, okay? And we've labeled it so that we can mix these together. So now we can put them on the array, and this is gonna be set up similarly, so I'll 
Again, it looks exactly the same, but that's because there's a lot of similarities here. Here we're gonna have these fragments, again, that will match different chunks of the genome. So again, we're gonna be looking at this idea of hydrogen bonding, this sort of complementary nature that we're gonna be seeing here. That's what we're gonna be looking at, okay? So we're gonna drop all of our DNA down. Okay, we've labeled it, it's all prepared and mixed. All right, and this looks a little bit different, okay? In principle, because we're not dealing with expression, you should find copies of, of everything. It should be a representative, just for the most part. You may not see every single thing stick, but we're not looking at expression. We're just detecting the presence of DNA and kind of trying to get sort of a quantity associated with it. So you can see some of these just offhand look more pink, okay? Pink was our tumor cell, all right? So what might it mean if you have more pink in the sample? Okay, some of these look a little more green. You can see some of these little ghosty guys looking a little bit more yellow. Okay, so let's look at this again in our sort of top-down approach here. And you can see again, some of these look really pink. Some of them look really green. Some of them, this is that like ghosty Christmas brown, but again, in fluorescence time, that would be yellow. Okay, so again, I think this is probably a really good time to pause that video. What does it mean when we have each type of fluorescence? What does green mean? What about red and what about yellow? Okay guys, so welcome back. All right, I don't have a slide with a nice picture on it. There is one in your book, so I recommend that you look at it if you're interested. But again, thinking about the idea that if you see more pink, it just means more fluorescently labeled pink was there. It literally means there was more DNA from the pink sample, which in this case, this was our tumor cells. Okay, so this means that there was extra DNA or at least some type of duplication. There's more copies of this area in the tumor cell than should be there. If we see something green, that means, remember that green is gonna be, that's our standard, okay? So we're basing everything off of that. If we see more green, it means that in the tumor cell, there was less there. So there's been a deletion of some sort. If we see yellow, then we'll be looking at places where we still have equal copy number when we're comparing between the two. So that is kind of what we're looking at, okay? So again, thinking about what these mean, you'll be asked to interpret these types of experiments. So make sure that you're really comfortable with what these assays are measuring. Are we looking at expression? Are we looking at DNA quantity? What exactly are we measuring? And what the different fluorescence colors mean? Okay, so I told you guys we'd see some other examples of how to think about a genome. So this is kind of the comparative genomics part of the slide set before we really get into the functional part where we start to, as geneticists, really screw things up. Okay, that'll be in our next video. Um, I told you guys we'd have some examples of how other ways to compare genomes. Okay, so hopefully, again, you've seen these microarrays or these DNA chips. This is still an okay way to look at gene expression. I think now a lot of people really use things like Illumina sequencing or like the Minion nanopore sequencing. Um, those are the types of sequencing tools that people seem to be using more presently. Um, but microarrays give you some information as well. Okay, so a lot of times if people are still using microarrays now, I think a lot of times what that means is they probably still had some microarray, the chips like in the back freezer somewhere and they're just trying to use them up. But I think, again, most people have transitioned to doing assays that would be more trend, like these high throughput sequencing transcriptome experiments, okay? So as you sort through NCBI, you may see experiments where they talk about being a microarray. This is what we're talking about. But there are lots of ways to approach the problem. The essence is we're looking at some cases differential gene expression, some cases we're actually trying to quantify the amount of DNA. There's a lot of different things that we can do. Okay.
So now on to the last couple of examples. So I won't spend a lot of time on them, but I think they're worth mentioning, particularly because a lot of this high throughput sequencing technology has made these sorts of things possible. Okay, so we've got three different examples. Okay, so one is kind of an evolutionary um, kind of approach or phylogenetic analysis. Okay, so this particular one is from a publication comparing, I want to say like 81 different parasitic worm species, so nematodes, um, those types of things. And the idea behind this was to try and find similarities, um, thinking about the way that they metabolize things, the way that they generally operate at a cellular level, to try and think about how to approach treatment. So again, these are not just regular, like minding their own business nematodes. These are like parasitic ones. You can see we've got um, some of the platyhelminth, these types of things there. Here's some actually some solid tapeworms down here. I mean, these are just some really nasty guys. So thinking about if we can think, what do they have in common? What's different about them? How can we direct treatment? And you can see we have one of these like beautiful sort of uh, phylogenetic relationships going on here. You can see everything kind of clustering together. And this was possible because we were able to sequence genomes. So this is a comparative approach. And again, we can make these phylogenetic trees before we really started sequencing the genome, but this just makes it a lot easier because again, if you think about markers as being the places that you can see, it's a lot easier to make whole comparisons if you can see the whole thing. So that's what we're looking at here. Okay, our second example, I think it's really interesting. So thinking about the microbiome. So microbiomes are kind of, I think even a fairly popular topic and sort of, um, you know, science floating around social media, see a lot of the pop site articles about microbiomes and, you know, things like gut health and is your diet affecting it? There've been a lot of studies that try to tie gut bacteria or microbiomes to things like autoimmune disorders, um, not necessarily causing autism, but perhaps making the symptoms more severe, um, those types of things kind of linking some of the idea that gut microbiome, the bacterial species that are present, can affect health at the overall level. And they've not really stopped with gut bacteria. There have been plenty of papers where they've basically swabbed every orifice that you could potentially think of. Okay, and so this one just focuses on gut bacteria, but you can see a lot of these different studies. Okay, so this is going to rely on a lot of high throughput sequencing. What they usually sequence in these types of studies is the uh, ribosomal RNA, the gene for the ribosomal RNA. That's how we end up getting kind of these sequence differences so that we can identify bacteria. Okay, and you can just see different types of bacteria. So I think this was just sort of like a general idea, but if you look in literature, you can see comparing the gut bacteria to bacteria on your skin, in your eyes, nasal passages. I mean, again, any orifice that you really want to think about or don't think about, all that stuff. And comparing, again, things like the severity of maybe an autoimmune disorder or something like that. So again, comparing the huge population of gut bacteria that might be present to other um, individuals or other bacterial species that are present in other places. So microbiome is a really big topic of study. Okay, and for our last example, comparing structures across species. So how is the genome actually put together? So this is a really popular way to study genomes, um, particularly when you're first publishing the genome. So when you sequence it and you want to get that paper out, it's really a popular thing to do to think about comparing the structures, like where are all the genes in relation to where they are in another species. Okay, this is also kind of popular to do if you are doing a really in-depth um, evolutionary analysis, if you're trying to see like where genome duplications occurred or kind of map those out. This is another time you do this. So what we're looking at here are a few plant species. So white clover, which we'll see, their chromosomes represented in gray. 
red clover. This is going to be represented in red. So here are the chromosomes for red clover. On the top figure here, part A, we're looking at Manicago. So these are going to be legume species. Manicago is one of them. Okay, and you can see the eight chromosomes from Manicago. All right, and so what we are looking at here, basically these lines are going to be chunks of the genome, okay, and they can be fairly large, but it's hard to tell because we're so zoomed out from the actual chromosome, but where they actually landed. So you can see things like in red clover, we'll see that wherever chromosome three, whatever's on that, over evolutionary time ended up part of this, a big chunk of it on chromosome eight in Metacago, and then maybe some of those over here sprinkled sort of liberally on three and four. Okay, so you can see that the white clover we're actually looking at being more similar to chromosome three in Metacago. So there's just a lot of ways to look at this. Okay, again, with our white clover, you can see chromosome four, a little bit on chromosome eight, but a large chunk of it on what ended up being Metacago four. So again, comparing the structure. You get a similar idea down here with Lotus japonicus, um, which is a model species, it's also a legume, okay, so related. But you can just see sort of how this is structured. All right, I would say, you know, that I think Metacago, you can see a lot more sort of conserved chunks where the whole chunk picked up and moved together, whereas when you look at Lotus japonicus, everything's kind of spread out quite a bit more. Like you see a lot more strings going this way, going that way, going the other way. So things that started out on one chromosome don't always end up on the same chromosome. So that's kind of how you think about the structure. And again, this is something that's really popular for people to do when they're trying to like maybe publish a genome for the first time and compare it to known genomes, or when they're trying to really get an in-depth analysis what's going to be different between clover and metacago, those types of things. Um, so looking, you know, where all of these pieces ultimately landed over evolutionary time. So that's another way that we can use comparative genomics. So there are a lot of different ways to use this. Really, again, comparing anything that you think is interesting enough to compare. So in conclusion, this can be used to show differences in gene expression, it can be used as a diagnostic tool. Uh, we can compare genomes across species. We can find out more about microbiomes.